thank you everybody for coming tonight. We've got an hour to, uh, to discuss for the Walkster. It's going to be coming up in just a second uh, to kick it off. Um, and want to, is everybody feeling as flat as I am right now? I spent the last hour and a half or two hours up at the church trying to print something off. My computer would not print. So I'm very angry right now. <laughs> and I don't have my printouts with me that I intended to bring tonight. So uh, that is that. Uh, so uh, are you all as frustrated as me? As <laughs> I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm good. Anyway, we're glad y'all came. I've got I've got a few minutes to sit and listen to Brother Walkstetter and unwind before it's my turn. Thank y'all for coming tonight. We're going to do. We're going to get into. Uh, we're going to move on uh, shortly, the next week or the week after, most likely, because you could spend months talking about Darwinism and finding another uh, uh, YouTube clip to watch and get mad all over again and go through it all. We can go through the whole book of Genesis letter for letter, but uh, we're going to, in the next couple of weeks, move on to some other things, maybe the flood and then into the law, things of that nature. Um, I say Genesis, so I know the flood is in Genesis, but we're going to leave the creation and Darwinism debate, may come back to it later. So, Get what you can get tonight. Brother Walker has been doing a fantastic job as far as laying out the, the more um, um, secular side of it and problems with that. And uh, so we'll do that again tonight. Thank you for coming. I wonder if we could uh, open with prayer tonight. And I, I would wish that, that uh, God would open our minds. I want this to be a spiritual thing, not just learning more stuff. But I'd like it to be a spiritual thing. The earth is in terrible shape to, tonight. And, um, and the only peace any of us are ever going to have is what we find in his word. Amen. Amen. So uh, let's, let's ask him to open up our minds tonight and see if we can learn something from him. Father, we love you. We bless you right now. Hallelujah. God, we ask that you would open the minds and the hearts, Lord, of each and every one of us who gathered here tonight, Lord. Lord, I pray that something would be spoken, Lord, and that your word would come alive in someone's mind, someone's heart and life tonight. God, I ask it in your name. Hallelujah. I pray that you'd make us strong, strong believers, Lord. Strong believers in you as the creator and the savior of our lives. Lord, we bless you, we praise you, we give you thanks. Bless this gathering tonight in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Brother Walsh, come right now and get us started. Amen. How many appreciate Pastor Whitley here tonight? Oh, yes. Yeah. Amen. 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 Yes, Lord. Amen. Also, the media department of uh, the yes. Bible Church is doing a great job. Amen. Amen. Kelly. And, uh, he also has uh, some yeah, the, uh, DVDs available. This, this is the four DVD set, and it's about uh, uh, things here. First four weeks, and so we're trying to put the information in your hands. If you don't get it all tonight, that's all right. Uh, you may want to, Christmas is around the corner, so they make perfect stocking stuffers. <laughs> like that. Let's go ahead and hit this with Jude 3. Beloved. <laughs> Ready to begin. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And of course, we talked about the stout defense for that earnestly content. Again, we're not, we're not trying to be argumentative just for the sake of arguments, but we have to defend what we believe, Amen. Uh, particularly when there are those that would love to sort of knock away uh, the very foundation of what we believe, which is one of the reasons why, as Pastor talked about last week, did a marvelous job. Uh, the enemy would love to deprive us of the book of Genesis because of so much of what we understand, what we believe, is based in Genesis. If we begin to question Genesis, then, of course, we begin to question uh, the rest of the Bible. And, of course, we were talking about witnesses of a creator. And uh, last week, uh, we talked about cells. I may remember that, and we talked a little bit about uh, irreducible complexity. How many remember the idea of irreducible complexity? Right. That after a while, if you continue to reduce it, uh, that you get into a situation where it's no longer a functioning machine. And we talked about cells. And we talked about that one of the theories of science is what we call cell theory, that cells come from other cells. Okay. Uh, there are three basic principles that I can think of right now that evolution kind of goes against science. 
accepted science. One of them is cell theory. The other one, of course, is the law of biogenesis. Life comes from life. And then, of course, the third law that we can talk about is the second law of thermodynamics, right? The idea that things go from, in a system, things move from order to disorder, right? right? Those are three main concepts. But we're, of course, talking about um, witnesses, if you would. And so let's talk about the witnesses of DNA. DNA. And let's look to the Psalms, Psalm 8. And uh, I believe this might be, for those that are in Bible quizzing, this may be one of the Psalms that you memorize. Is it? I don't know. You know Bible quizzing? Okay. Here we go. Uh, verse number one. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens, out of the mouth of babes and suckling thou hast ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest be still, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider the heavens, remember we talked about, last week we talked about looking at the heavens and using the telescope. How many remember that? How many with me tonight? Uh, when I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, pastor teaching about the creation of all those things. The question is, what is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou madest him a little lower than the angel and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Now notice that the psalmist here, which is David, is actually moving right back into Genesis chapter 1, isn't he? You'll notice that he is right into Genesis 1, where he is, he's observing the stars, and now he's reflecting upon mankind. Good. And as he's reflecting on mankind, he's reflecting on this idea of, of dominion. Right? That we have dominion. God has empowered us. <clears throat> thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, the beast of the field. Notice the concept here that the animals are in subject to us. Right. Not that we are a highly, informed, a highly evolved form of animal, but that there is a distinction between human beings and animals. That's one of the things that you see begin to be blurred, right? The more and more we talk about evolution, you'll hear people that love animals and think people are okay. <laughs> yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Right. You know, they, they begin to, oh, we love it. Oh, look at kid. Oh, look at, look. oh, Facebook, look, there's a dog. And people are, yeah, that type of thing. The sheep and the fowl of the air fish of the sea and what sort of passes through the paths of the sea, which of course is a scientific discovery in and of itself. Uh, o oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. We're talking about DNA tonight, and I have to be honest, I'm doing this for Chase, uh, he asked me to do this, he actually knows more about DNA than I do. I don't know that much about DNA, <laughs> just to be frank with you. Uh, I do know I do know that basically it stands up in the court of law today. Yeah. I do know that basically if a person is convicted, or more importantly, if evidence is proven that the conviction was faulty, if they have DNA evidence, they throw those cases out. How many with me so far? Right. And it doesn't seem like that uh, I, I've always had this kind of theory, and I'm going to go ahead and shoot it to you right now. If I am ever arrested of a crime, and they've got DNA evidence. I'm putting evolution on trial. And basically say, that's not my DNA, it evolved. <laughs> say, and see what they say at that point in time. That's gonna be real fun. Let's talk about what we do know about DNA. How many's ever heard of Crick and Watson? Uh, Watson was with Sherlock Holmes. This is a different Watson. These are the guys that basically, uh, they won the Nobel Prize science for for creating a model of DNA. And of course, it's the model that you're probably familiar with if you ever think of DNA molecules. It's the double helix. It's the idea of the twisted ladder, okay? The ladder that's all twisted and coiled. How many with me so far when you talk about DNA? And they were able actually to make a model of that. That's what they won uh, the, the deal for. And as they begin to 
determine what DNA was, they discovered that basically one of these molecules, if you were to take it, it's all coiled up like that. If you were to take it and spool it out, it would be six feet long of a molecule. Now again, you wouldn't be able to see the molecule, but six feet in length, all of that of information to make up you, to make up the basic you, okay? And that's in every one of the cells of your body, all of that information. And it basically records your sex, your approximate height, approximate weight, <clears throat> your uh, eye color, hair color, vital information, some of your intelligence, and that's in every one of the cells of your body, okay? And you can see here that is inside of 100 trillion cells. One person. One person. So we have six feet of length in each one of those cells 100 trillion times, okay? Now, scientists marvel at how this has provided information needed to create all the proteins. Stop and think about every person you've ever seen and how, just kind of look around the room real quick, and here we are in a fairly closed community. We all live in a small town in Arkansas, right? But stop and think about the variety even within this room. And then think of which one is the best looking. That's easy. Okay, don't think of the opposite way, okay? But you see here, of course, uh, created all the proteins uh, that our body uh, has constructed. Embedded are 23 pairs of chromosomes with 30,000 genes that yield as many as tw uh, 20,500 kinds of proteins. Those are big numbers, right Chase? That's one thing Chase told me to keep emphasizing. Big numbers. Okay. Uh -huh. DNA serves as the information storehouse for a finely choreographed manufacturing process in which the right amino acids are linked together with the right bonds in the right sequence to produce the right kind of proteins that fold in the right way to build biological systems. How many understand what that's kind of saying? That basically DNA is right. And that it's, it's, it's extremely rare, this idea of just simply replicating it somehow uh, and producing another me is impossible. Okay. Now, of course, this is referring to dioxyribonucleic acid. And you can see the double helix there. How many, how many are you kind of familiar with now? Now I show you a picture of it, you kind of know what I'm talking about. Yeah. All right. And you have to keep in mind that this is not something that really can be produced randomly by chance. It's just not. When we begin to look at it, it provides a library. Now, again, let's not get into all of this. Um, but the idea is the key to discovering the origin of life is to understand the origin of biological information. Now, uh, again, Bill Nye said evolution, of course, is the foundation of life science. Well, really, cells are the beginning of life science, and DNA is even more core than that. Uh, scientists already know and agree that DNA provides the code for building the cell's components. And we talked about cells last week. So stop and think about that basically a DNA for a blueprint of you. Okay? Stop and think about that for a second. I want to make another mark. Everybody's ever heard of cloning? How do they clone? They replace DNA in cells. That's the idea. Okay? And basically, you then have a carbon copy of you. Never be as good looking as all this, because there are certain things, but pretty close. Okay? The issue then is, where did this genetic information come from? Okay, where did the original DNA, now let's, as we talk about evolution a little bit tonight, I want you to kind of suspend the total disbelief in DNA, I mean, in the total disbelief in, in evolution, and we'll put it on the shelf for a while, because evolutionists teach that all life is connected, because every creature has DNA. Are you with me so far? Not just human beings, dogs have DNA. Cats have DNA, 
Birds have DNA. Trees have DNA. Okay? So that we're all, again, in their mind, we're all connected through the tree of life and different things like that. Uh, the stores of instructions for protein assembled for this um, a four-character code. And these are normally represented that you'll see here by A, G, C, and T. And they replicate many, many, many times. Okay? Now, the proper arrangements of these characters instruct the cells to build a sequence of amino acids, the building blocks of proteins. <laughs> so basically, why didn't, if trees have DNA, why am I not wooden? Okay? If fish have DNA, why, why are they don't have wings? Because DNA has told them, okay, the building blocks, the, 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 if you would, the blueprints. They open up, the cell opens up his blueprints and said, oh, this thing is supposed to be a mammal, which means it's supposed to have hair, and mammary glands, and all of that sort of stuff, yada, yada, yada. And it's supposed to have a tail, and it's supposed to have floppy ears, and they're supposed to call it Spot, and it's supposed to be trained, and it's going to be a dog. Okay, how many with me so far? All right. Now, uh, as, we, as we look a little bit about that, using the analogy of a library will help us understand uh, the DNA uses to build protein molecules. Long rows of A, G's, C's, and T's meticulously arranged to form the protein structure. So we're talking about, if we were to say a, a, a letter, a word, if you would, a word that's 2,000 letters long, 2,000 letters long to make up one little protein. That's a long word. And if I change one of those letters inside there, I have a totally different word. How many with me so far? Right. Okay. So that's like saying on a library shelf, an entire shelf dedicated to you, Tire shelf dedicated to the person sitting on your right, tire shelf dedicated to the person sitting on your left. Everybody in this room shelves. Every creature, every person on the planet, billions of shelves. Every creature, okay, trees, plants, blades of grass, amoebas, hmm. all of these in this idea. A lot of information. Now let's go back to the Bible just for a second. And let's look at what David had to say here. Uh, in Psalm 139. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the light shineth as the day. Darkness and light are both alike to thee. For thou, notice, for thou hast possessed my reins. Now the reins, of course, are talking from the biblical perspective kind of our very inners, the very guts of who we are. He said, you know what? I can sit in darkness and still, I can still be formed in darkness because I have been that before. Because you possess my reins. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made, marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret, and curiously wrought in the lower parts of the earth. My eyes did see my substance, thine eyes, excuse me, did see my substance yet being unperfect. In other words, unformed, God knew who I was going to be. Right. Now, stop and think about that. Of course, we can talk about the foreknowledge of God. We can talk about all that sort of stuff. But stop and think about that moment of conception where those two cells, every sex cell in our body, right, has these pairs, 23 pairs of chromosome, except one type of cell, right? Those are our sex cells. The sperm and the egg unite. Now we have 23 pairs coupling up together. We have a human being. And he says, right there, mm -hmm. you knew everything about me. You knew, you knew who I was going to be and what I was going to be right there. Again, if, if you stop and think about it like that, then 
the abortion issue isn't really that difficult right. to talk about. All right? Thine eyes did see my substance yet being unperfect. And in thy book, in thy book, all my members were written. Now, what book is he talking about? Well, there could be a book out there, or there could be the book of science. The one that we basically says, in my book, right there. Did you see that? I just pulled off a little skin cell. It's on the tip of my finger. And in that book, all of my members are written. It is going to tell me that I'm going to be a tall, white, kind of overweight, very smart, sometimes kind of funny, <laughs> brown hair, brown eyed man that's going to have five fingers and five toes right there. All of those things are recorded, which in continuance were fashioned when there was yet none of them. In other words, before those fingers were there, it's already right here. How many within? Good, good, good. good. Alright? How precious are thy thoughts unto me. In other words, when, when we as believers, again, when we look at DNA, we should say, thank God. What a God that has made us alike but unique. <laughs> so that we have, we have areas where we overlap, so we have the ability to communicate, but we're all different. That's an amazing concept. And how precious your thoughts are unto me, O oh God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they are more than number than the sand. When I am awake, I am still with thee. It's okay if I'm in darkness right now. And there's some, there's some again, if we wanted to stop and take this into a, a real spiritual realm, you know, realm there for a while. If you're in darkness right now, can development still happen? Yes. It has before. It, right. it happened when you were just that one cell that became two, which became four, which became eight, which became 16. And all of a sudden, everything that you were to be comes into fruition. Okay. So, now let's go back to some of our teachings. How about Jeremiah? Uh -huh. This is the Lord speaking to him. And I love this passage. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee and ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Now, we could say again, God just had foreknowledge on someone like this person and just said, I, I, I've ordained you. This, you're going to be a prophet. Or, again, DNA contains so much information, uh, it, even, it even contains uh, the leaning of our temperament from what they tell us. In other words, are we going to be kind of passive, or are we going to be active? Does anybody know what kind of person Jeremiah was? And he's a weepy, right? He's a weepy prophet. They said, you know what, I already saw that in you, and that's what I want to use. Okay. You're a weepy guy in an in a unweepy world, okay. but that's okay. I know who you are, and I've already chosen that, and I'm going to use that. Now, again, let's go back to this science. Now, we know about all this information. Andrew, if we, again, as we talk about it, if we were to say, you know, it holds up in court, I'm different than you are, DNA and all that sort of stuff, here's the question. Where did this information originate? Where did the first set, the first six foot long deal of DNA, where did it come from? Okay? If everything is connected by its DNA, and again, if you ever heard those statistics they throw out, they say, you're 99% related to a monkey. How many ever heard somebody say something like, what are they saying? They're saying you share 99% of the same DNA. Yeah. Okay. 99%. Actually, we're 100% related because we all came from the same engineer. We all came from the same architect. We all came from the same designer. Right. If you look at homes and you have someone like uh, Frank Lloyd Wright and you say, that's a Wright home. I will, you know, sometimes people like to go visit them. 
because he was the architect that built all of them. Okay, he's the common designer, he used common designs, he used common themes when he created something. That doesn't mean all the tree, uh, that all those uh, homes came from the same mom and dad, but they came from the same mind up here. All right? So, how do we have this naturalistic explanation of where DNA comes from? Well, this is the big one that you hear people talk about. The premortal soup, or the prebiotic soup. Now, don't go into the, the, uh, the diner and order this. We don't want to do that. Darwin talked about this a long time ago, 1871. He speculated that pretty much what there would be here on Earth a long time ago is just all of the, of the ingredients, okay? All the ingredients that make up a person would just sort of be floating in a soup, okay? And there would be ammonia, uh, heat and light and, and, and electricity, and then boom, all of a sudden comes DNA, okay? And actually there have been some various experiments trying to do this. You'll see uh, if you have uh, biology courses, something like that, you have uh, the idea of the Miller experiment that was done in the 60s. Miller experiment said, oh look, we made, a, uh, we made uh, the uh, amino acids. Oh, it's awesome and which are the building blocks of proteins, which are the building blocks of DNA, which, ooh, we did it. No, you didn't. Here's your problem. Number one, there is no evidence anywhere on this earth that such a soup ever existed. Okay? Right. The second thing that's scientifically provable is that whatever kind of system, again, one of these things is ammonia. Okay? Now, I don't know much about ammonia, but I know if you mix in ammonia and you keep that cell or you keep that deal there, guess what the ammonia is going to do? It's going to break apart what it put together. How many with me so far? So the idea is in Miller's experiment that you'll hear people talk about, if you don't know anything about it, don't worry about it. But if you do know about Miller's experiment, that proved it. No. What they did was they cheated. They pulled off these amino acids as quick as they created them. That's cheating. You're supposed to have a closed system. And in the closed system, there is no pulling it out. So the same conditions that create, destroy. Okay, so that's, there is no way. They can't do this in a closed system. Or guess what? It would be on the cover of National Geographic tomorrow. We have made prebiotic soup. We can create life. Now again, what can they do? They can go in and they can uh, take apart cells to a certain degree. They can pull DNA out of a cell and then put other DNA into the cell. But they can't make DNA. All right. They're even they're even create they're even you know trying to work with the idea of 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 somehow doing it in such a way. You probably heard this you know like you can pick the color of your child's eyes because they've been able to map DNA and say this section determines the eye color of your child. If you don't want blue eyes for your child, if you want brown eyes for your child, we can guarantee that. Now, that to me sounds a little bit too much like Nazi Germany. That's me. Maybe it's because I'm German. Here we go. Okay. So we also talked about if it did exist, that pretty much it would also interfere with the formation of life. It would destroy what it had created almost as soon as it created it. Now what about chance? Random chance, that's something else that you see. The roll of the die, or the roll of the dice. Okay? <clears throat> Rejected by both scientists, it's still in vogue at a popular level. In other words, most scientists do not believe in random chance. Let's go back to that analogy, okay, of your life being a library bookshelf. Let's pretend that pretty much what we did was we took letters, like of a scrabble, and we just threw them on the ground. We fill up this room right now with just tiles, and we just walked around, and we begin to read 
In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And we, we made in this, just by throwing out tiles, we made Genesis, the entire book of Genesis on this floor. Is that going to happen? No. That's not going to happen. If you walked in this room and there was Genesis laid out in tiles on the ground, guess what you would think? Somebody's been in here. You would think, my goodness. Whoa. That's amazing. All right, so uh, yeah, let's, let's get, get rid of that there for a second. Okay, not only that, but you also have problems. Again, Chase, correct me if I'm wrong. But you see here that only certain ones can bond, okay? Um, there are what's called right-handed, left-handed. You can see by the way that they're structured, right-handed molecules, left-handed molecules. They require left-handed molecules. If a right-handed molecule tries to bond in, it will not create DNA. So that minimizes the, the chances. So much so that basically what we see here is the random possibility of something like this happening with one of the smallest proteins, okay? The smallest protein, one molecule, just one, and you need molecules that stretch all the way out, uh, is 10 to 25 zeros. That's the number right there for one. And you need some 300 to 500 of these protein molecules to make up DNA. We call that impossible. That could be where I'm from. Somebody's way past, but yeah. No. It's not. No. In fact, if you took all the particles in the universe, stop to think about every particle, every atom in the universe, the number is smaller than that. Okay, so, no. Uh, how about natural selection? Again, we have the problem with natural selection, and I got a roll here. Natural selection could help us understand how the beaks on finches change. Survival of the fittest, we talked about that. We don't have a problem with that. We don't have a problem with, um, you know, in a certain setting that you can breed dogs together, and have big dogs and breed dogs together and get little dogs. But that doesn't tell us where it comes from the beginning. It doesn't answer where the original dogs come from. And it definitely doesn't answer where the original DNA comes from. Uh -huh. You can see here, what's certainly not open for debate is the work at the chemical level. Darwinists admit that natural selection needs a self-replicating organism to work. In other words, it needs something that can, can multiply. Right. But if there's no DNA, how does it multiply? Right? How many with me so far? Right. Before I shoot this back over to him. All right, let's do what? Let's do. Okay? We talked about that. We have already explained how improbable it is with that. How about this one? This is my favorite. Directed. Spam, spermia. You go, oh, that sounds weird. Pan means all. Spermia, sperm is the, the word in Latin for seed. Okay? Directed. And that's the idea that DNA seeds have been purposely spread throughout the universe by advanced extraterrestrial civilizations. Okay. <laughs> Okay. In other words, in the model, a rocket ship was sent out. Uh, how many? How many know? I hope you do. Do you know who Superman is? Superman is an illegal alien. I, I'm telling you. You don't think about it like that. But he can never be president and all that sort of, stuff, sort of jazz. I don't see a green card. None of that. Maybe he's naturalized. I don't know. But you know, he actually comes from another planet. He's an alien, true alien. The idea was there are those that favor this, actually, instead of a, a space program. Take our DNA, put it in rocket ships, and just shoot it all throughout the universe. And maybe our DNA will at least survive. Okay? Uh, apparently, this is the what, and you go, man, who in the world? 
Who is going to believe something like this? Well, again, this is Wikipedia. I can't guarantee it. But historically, this person with a very long name, which you can tell he's intelligent, just be able to spell this, and Sagan, Crick, and Orgel suggested that life on Earth may have been seeded deliberately by other civilizations. Now stop and think about that for a second. There's a couple of names up here you should be familiar with. One of them is Sagan. And who's that? That's Bill Nye, former professor. Now, as he was talking, as my mentor used to say, Carl Sagan, whenever you love something, you're going to talk about it. You didn't tell us, by the way, that Carl Sagan believed that DNA got here by somebody on the other side of the universe that shot a rocket ship full of DNA. What was another name on here that we should recognize? Crick. Crick knows more about, or knew more, he's dead now. He used to live in San Diego, taught there. Knew more about DNA than any person on the planet. And you know what he said? I can guarantee you one thing. It didn't come here. It did not come by accident. It was easier for Dr. Crick to believe somebody on the other side of the universe made a rocket ship, Kal-El or somebody like that, put DNA in it, shot it here to planet Earth, and evolution began that way, than to believe any of the other ideas. Now, let's go here just for a second. Uh, how about this God idea? How about the God idea? Now, again, we don't believe in God because of all the things. We're just saying we do believe in God, and it fits already. Everything that we do know. Let's look to the scripture real quickly before I turn this back to the pastor. Romans chapter number 1. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown it unto them. Now catch this. Very important. This is New Testament. How many ever heard of the New Testament? It's written to Christians. By Christians to Christians. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. In other words, this is saying science should teach us something about God. Right? The things that are clearly seen are understood. We understand invisible things. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. Stop and think about this and everything we've just talked about. They knew God, but they did not glorify him as God. Neither were thankful. They became vain in their imaginations. Their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise. The word wise, of course, is sophos. They became fools or moros. Morons. <laughs> Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of an incorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man. Now listen. Into birds and four-footed beasts and creepy things. Now obviously we can see that this is talking about idolatry, right? But what is present day idolatry? Boom, tree of life. We can believe that Joel Whitley created the image of God or a series of accidents in which his mother was a seal. I mean, way back then, grandmother was a seal. Okay? Great grandmother was a starfish. We have changed, to a certain extent, we have changed the glory of the incorruptible God into images. Stop and think about the images of evolution. And what do they do? They basically take man and put him back into the dust from which he came. And again, I choose to believe what I believe. Part of the reason why is I like to see Joel Whitley made in the image of God. I think that's a place where we have hope. And not only that, I think it, it best fits the facts. All right, Pastor, would you tell us? Woo, that was good. Um, what did I know? Okay. That was 
extremely good. I want to take a few minutes. I don't know what time it is. I may go a, a, a few minutes over. Uh, they won't run us out, I hope. Uh, I don't use the technology as well as he does, so we'll just go back to the go back to my little grease board over here. Um, there's as he was teaching uh, this evening, I I thought of Hebrews 11 chapters uh, chapter 11 verse 1 to 3. Um, everybody, if you've got a Bible, read that with me. It, it, the, the scripture is incredible. Because of when it was written, it was the things that it gives us insight to, they are discovering today. And it was written. It says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. It says, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. That is to say that these this DNA, the cells, the everything submicroscopic that right. that everything is made out of. He didn't say. He said the things that you see are made of things that you cannot see, which is an incredible thing. Yes. Uh, and we're discovering that they're winning Nobel Peace Prize, the Nobel Prizes for science and so forth uh, by discovering the things that he told us millennia ago. Uh, and so the, the scripture is stands on its own. Okay, it stands on its own. And it is a, it's a tremendous thing to sit and look through these things. I'm going to. Um, he mentioned a while ago that the uh, the the DNA similarities between a chimpanzee and a human being they they say are 99 percent. Now I have no way of verifying whether um, chimpanzee and, uh, and and human. I have to take their word for it. If they say that I am. <laughs> Similar to a chimpanzee, 99% of my DNA matches his. I can accept that, I suppose. Uh, but here's something else to think about. Um, my DNA is 45% identical to a, a daffodil. Okay? So I am, nearly, I am nearly half the same organism as a daffodil, a flower, a weed. Uh, so back to what he was saying earlier, uh, it's it's the the concept that we that all life came from an original ancestor uh, is an, is absurd. It, but we do understand that you can look at a, a painting of give me a famous painting. Um, yeah, you, you don't you don't have to see his name signed at the bottom. If anyone who's trained in it, and I couldn't I couldn't tell a Van Gogh from a from a Gas and Go, but. <laughs> But someone who's trained and understand that you look at it, it don't matter if it's a if it's a painting of a landscape or if it's a painting of a fruit dish. They know there are certain characteristics that are the same, and they can by the create they can look at a, a, a fruit basket and a landscape or a horse for that matter, and they can understand that all three of those works of art had an identical originator. Right. And that is that is really the testimony of DNA. Uh, it's not the, it's not that we all sprang from now. Darwin himself said that uh, I, I want to get off into some scripture here in just a second. But Darwin himself said that uh, if it were ever shown that complex organs could not be formed through random mutations, that his theory would fail. He, he himself said that, and that, by the way, has been shown. There's no way uh, the the eye, okay, right. the eye could the eye of any vertebrate could not could not evolve um, through incremental mutations. It could not. It has every come on back to the mouse trap. Back to the mouse trap. Uh, Brother Walter used this last week. I'm gonna get the scripture here in just a second, but this is a couple things that. This is a functioning mousetrap, I guess. Or got pieces of an unfunctioning mousetrap hanging on. And that's about as simple a machine as could as there could be. And then in this bag is a is a, another mousetrap that's been disassembled. And that's as simple. That's there's how long would you have to shake the bag before this became that? A billion years? How about sixty-five billion? That would work. You'd have 
smile, it doesn't matter how long you shake it. It's never going to assemble into the simplest mechanism. Ever. Never, ever, 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 ever. Doesn't matter. And this unguided, Darwinism is, a, is an unguided series of random mutations that happen just through the jostling of time that brings about a, a, a DNA or a molecule so complex, so more information, so, such precision that it would make uh, this machine, let alone this machine, look primitive. Mm -hmm. And to say it was just shaken together from a primordial soup is on his face insane. Now, I want to talk about the earth a little bit um, before we go uh, tonight. Um, again, I, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but you may know my little drawing here of, this, of the creative days, right? And the 31 verses that cover up till this point. Okay, 31 verses of Genesis chapter 1. If somebody's got a Bible, uh, look up, if you would, Psalm 104, verse 5, and then someone gets a... Who's got a Bible? Uh, okay, someone get Ecclesiastes 1.4. And uh, I'm going to read a couple of verses and, and maybe clarify, because what we're trying to do is build a skeleton. Okay, We want to build an alternative, an alternative. We can sit up here and bash Darwin all day long. Okay, Darwin made so many mistakes, and it's reasonable that he would. Okay, he was making assumptions of things that we would not understand for another 150 years. Okay, and so as anybody, he made, his, his, his works are full of errors. I mean, some of them now are comical errors as we begin to learn more and more about cells, DNA, things of that nature. But that's fine, we can sit and bash Darwin all day long. But we are going to have to have an alternative, right? Right. We're going to have to have an alternative belief system that makes more sense and thus far I think we have achieved something that makes more sense okay um, but uh, the earth the, the the days of creation somebody read Psalm 104 quickly out loud who laid the foundations of the earth that it should not be removed forever okay he uses the words here the foundation foundation and the word for ever Foundation and forever, he said, he's laid the foundations of the earth that it would, how, what's, the, what's the phraseology there, how do you, how do you say it? He's laid, he laid the foundations of the earth that it should not be removed forever. The foundation of the earth would not be removed forever. The foundation of the earth would not be removed forever. Okay, this is all going fitting into our skeleton of creation. The meat and the bones, you, once you get the skeleton, you know basically what creation would look like. So, and, and read Ecclesiastes quickly, if you would. Ecclesiastes chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 4. One generation passes away, and another generation cometh, but the earth abides forever. Okay. One generation passes, another comes on. He said, but the earth abided forever. He said, the foundation of the earth, the fundamental um substance of earth once it's here now we, i told you last week that a very key scripture in genesis 2 1 right. creation is finished that's when he said he created the, all of the earth and the host of it so everything that's in the earth and everything that will be in the earth has already been established by genesis 2 1 there's nothing anything else that comes to be comes to be through recreation or it comes to be through cell division not making any more stuff. Okay? Now, uh, so it says the foundation of the earth is forever and that the earth will abide forever. Oh, what's going to happen at the end of the world? Okay, the earth, the scripture says, abides forever. Its foundations were laid and they are never going to pass away. The foundations of the earth. Now we talked about uh, one, two, three, four, five, the sixth day, and I think we, we got an understanding. Uh, we'll read it in just a moment. Um, well, I'll tell you what, let's read it right now. Let's go to uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 quickly. I'm going to take my time. I got in a big hurry last week. Uh, 
I'm going to take my time and uh, Oh, let's see. Where would we start here? Let's start reading. Um, oh, heavens, let's start reading verse 1. This second epistle, beloved, I write unto you, both to stir up your pure mind by way of remembrance, that ye, I better speak more clearly because this is going to be easy, okay. That ye may be mindful of the words which are spoken before of the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles, and of... Um, of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts, saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they are willingly ignorant of, that the word of God, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which now are by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Okay. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. One day is with the Lord, a thousand years, a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. That, that one day, that, this is my opinion, that one day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day, is, is an expression of Peter's to say, you know, the scoffers are saying, where is the promise of his return? You've heard this all your life. He said, well, you have to understand from God's perspective, a day passes like a thousand years. And right. what seems like forever for us is just two days ago to him. Yes. We're, we're here 2,000 years later saying, we've been hearing this all up. But to him, it's just a day yesterday. I think that's the expression that's being made. Now, others will take the, the thousand year the, the 1,000 year day here and, and apply it. I'm not going to argue with that. This is this is my theory. This is my skeleton. Uh, I believe that these creative days were, were far longer than that. We'll get into that, I hope. But um, anyway, I don't want to lose you there. But he says, a thousand years is one day. So the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some may count slackness, but his long suffering to us we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. For the day of the Lord it will come. As a thief in the night, and the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. All right. He says in verse 6, uh, or in verse uh, uh, 10, that the day of the Lord will come, the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also and the works thereof shall be burned up. Does that contradict what it says here? That the foundation is forever, and then it says in Ecclesiastes that the earth abideth forever. Does that contradict that? It says here that the heavens would pass away with a great noise, and the elements would melt with a fervent heat. Does that, does that contradict it? Because the scripture says clearly uh, in more than one place that, that the earth is forever. Well, I think the key of it all is this word right here, the foundation right, right. of the earth. I mean, you've seen in the aftermath of a tornado, you say that house is completely destroyed. Okay? The, the, what we read about, in my opinion, now again, let me reestablish something in case you forgot or perhaps you weren't here. We talk about how do we know we're in the sixth day. Genesis chapter 5 tells us clearly that these are the, gen these are the generations of Adam in the day that he was created. And it starts the genealogies, and the genealogies do not stop until they reach Jesus Christ. They don't stop. Right. The Bible is a continuous genealogy. So understand that. So these are the genealogies of Adam in the day that he was created. Uh, and we do know that Adam was created on the sixth day. He starts this genealogy. And at the conclusion of the sixth day, Peter records it, that the elements would burn, would melt with a fervent heat. And the heavens would pass away with a great noise. All right? Now, again, you can make the assumption. I don't know how each of these other days concluded. I don't know the period of time between any of these days. I don't know that. You can, you can stipulate anything you want. Okay? You can say there are millions and millions of years, and there's no reason why it couldn't be, and there's no reason why it would be. Okay? It's, if you, you believe what you want to believe, God is without time. He's not bounded by any of our... Uh, preconceptions, all right? We don't know how much time uh, elapsed. Uh, are you a, a believer in the gap theory? I am ambivalent towards the gap theory. 
I don't know how much time or if any time at all elapsed between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. It is irrelevant. Okay? It is irrelevant. But if, you, if it makes you feel better as we build this skeleton to, to put a little sinew there and say, well, there was time or there was, there was space between these three days, have at it. It's irrelevant. Okay. But in each of these days, if, if, if the evening and morning were the sixth day, the evening and morning, fifth, fourth, third, second, first, and we know how this one concludes, it's reasonable to assume that something very similar happened in each of these days. Okay. So the earth was the earth was renovated, wiped clean these five times. Okay, in one sense or another, judgment came as it did in this, as it will in this day, it did in this day, and this day, and this day, and this day. Okay, but in each of these things is the earth destroyed. The scripture says that the earth abided forever. The foundations are there. The foundations yeah. of the earth are there. The right. elements, the base elements are there. He doesn't just poof, blow it away. In judgment of the, of the sixth day that we read about in, in, in 2 Peter chapter 3 is not an annihilation of the earth. In fact, uh, we talked to someone last week about the dinosaurs. And by the way, I hope you went home in your concordance and looked up what the, the, the word whales means. It means dinosaurs. That's, what, that's so clearly what Genesis is talking about the whales that existed during the fifth day. And I was having a discussion with someone last week about the dinosaurs and what happened to the dinosaurs. I said, well, we still have them. Um, the, the, the crocodiles, the caiman, the, the alligators, they are, they are uh, dinosaurs. Okay? They are dinosaurs surviving, in my opinion. I'm building the skeleton here. Again, if you want to, we have 31 verses substantiating all of this. Can I fill in every one of these blanks with chapter and verse? I cannot. Okay? I, I tell you, I can do a whole lot better job of filling in the blanks here than they can fill in the blanks here. Okay? So, what I, Rocket ships. Come on! Why don't you just say God? Amen. Why would you not say God? Yeah, I'm just saying I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> Where was I at? Okay, the 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 uh, apocalypse. The that's not the right word. The the, the judgment of this day, if, it, if indeed it were somewhat similar to the judgment of this day, let's say, for sake of this discussion, that the judgment of this day were identical. Okay, if, if similar in some way. There was a cataclysmic event that brought the creatures of this day to their end, to their judgment. Okay, the let's say it's great heat. Let's say it's great, uh, um, a great cataclysmic event. What, who survives it? They, <coughs> the sharks obviously survived it. They were subterranean. They, they were they were marine creatures, and many marine creatures they uh, survived uh, because they lived underwater. Okay, the fire didn't burn under the water, and these dinosaurs who could live obviously these ginormous dinosaurs. These uh, that, that dwelt on the surface of the earth, but the subterranean dinosaurs, the, the ones who, the few that could go underground or could survive underwater, just with maybe sticking uh, their nose above water occasionally. This is my theory, okay? And it's much more plausible, but it's obvious that these dinosaurs did survive. These things that the Bible says were, existed the fifth day survived into the fifth day while nothing else did. The things in the sea and the things that could live subterraneanly survived. Why? Because the foundation of the earth was not destroyed. It all goes back to the foundation. The foundation of the earth was not destroyed. It's it's it, it didn't blow the earth away. He he took he renovated the earth. He melted it down and started all over in a few sea creatures. Not all, obviously. Perhaps just a handful of these creatures who could live. Uh, who, were, who were marine animals or subterranean animals. Maybe two, three, four. Maybe it was like Noah's Ark. I don't know. But a few of those survived in the sixth day. Okay. It's my theory. You don't have to, you don't have to approve of it, agree with it, or anything else. But this is a skeleton that I have built. Okay? Out of 31 verses. And in my opinion, if, if, even at the beginning when it starts with light and the sequence of these events, the the placing of these creations, the judgments, all of this fits. 
And this was written so long ago when all of these things could not have been known. All of these, uh, the things that we've learned today could not have been foreseen except by God. Now, what time is it? Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to quickly read three more passages of Scripture. Now, we're going to focus for a few minutes here on the life that exists here in the sixth day. This is the only day we really know anything about. The rest of this is assumption. We pretty much have a history of the sixth day. We have a history of the sixth day. It starts with the creation of these uh, uh, mammals on earth and then humankind. Human beings were born there. And then it starts the genealogy. It gives the entire history. It came to a man named Jesus. That's a cross there, by the way. And then uh, into the church age. And then we have an end of it. We have even the future of foretold. This is the only day we really know anything about. Everything backwards looking from that is an assumption. Okay? We know a little bit about the fifth day and what was created there. And, and maybe how it survived over the sixth day. But uh, everything else is an assumption. But I want you to look, again, going back to the, the concept of a foundation of the earth is forever. The foundation of the earth is forever. The, uh, Isaiah said, I made the, Lord, the, the earth to be inhabited. Yes. He said, I made the earth to be inhabited. Um, we read, uh, let's continue reading from 2 Peter before we move on. 2 Peter said, looking for and hastening to the coming of the day of God, verse 12. Wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, we seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot, blameless. You have, a, you have an impetus here to change the way you live. Uh, and he's using, he's using this. He said, if we... Look for these things, he said, according to the promise or his promise, we look for a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Because if you recall, there was a seventh day mentioned in the book of Genesis. And he's, he told them to keep it holy. And that's the most stressed commandment throughout the Old Testament. It changed in the New Testament. We'll get to that and we get to talking about the law. The book of Colossians clarifies us on the Sabbath and all of that. But uh, on the seventh day, there, there is the earth, and it's different. It's different because it doesn't have evening and morning. It seems as if there's no boundaries to time, and, that, and that's eternity, um, in my opinion. Now, if you go back to Isaiah chapter 65, people, I, I've had people who've lost pets. You ever lost a pet? I mean, one that you loved? They're going to be your dogs in heaven. What about... I don't know about my dog Blue. See, I don't know that. I don't have an answer to that question specifically. But that kind of gives us some, some insight. Now, Isaiah 65, I can't speak definitively as to what it's speaking about. I can read it one time, and that sounds like a millennial period. But if you read it in light of 2 Peter, there's no doubt what it's talking about. Okay, and perhaps it's like that onion of prophecy that has several layers. I, I haven't had to talk to everybody about those, but, but where they have several applications of the same scripture. But if you read Isaiah 65 in light of 2 Peter chapter 3, it is clear what he's talking about. Look at verse 17. It says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind, but ye, but ye but be ye glad and rejoice forever in that I create, or behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people, and the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. Okay, it goes on and it tells a pretty fantastic story of what he says. Now, obviously, Isaiah lived right here. He didn't live in the fifth day, fourth day, third day. He lived right here. And he says this, Isaiah says in prophecy, he said, I, the Lord, am going to create a new heaven and a new earth. There's going to be another one after this one. Okay, there's going to be another one after this one. He talks about what it will be like. He talks about the voice of crying and weeping will not be there. What else does he say uh, about it? Um, 
uh, it says, uh, the earth is that the former earth will not be remembered nor come into mind, but you should be glad and rejoice forever. So this day here, this earth here is a forever earth. Well, it says way back over here that it's forever. Okay? The foundation, although it has gone, it has been, there's been five train wrecks. And we're not too far away. And you, uh, if you count the millennial age and all that, but uh, we're not too far away from a six train wreck. And this thing blows up. Right. This thing blows up. And he said, I'm doing it over one more time. He said, and it will be forever. It will be forever. Now, Isaiah said that in the 65th chapter of Isaiah, and that's pretty much the last you hear about it. Or I don't, I don't know um, but off the top of my head that that language is referred to anymore at all until Peter comes along in 2 Peter chapter 3. And what does he say? We read it just a moment ago. He said, according to his promise. What promise? The promise of Isaiah 65. That's the only place that promise was made. Isaiah 65, he said, according to his promise, he said, we look for the new heavens and the new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Right? Right. Am I doing all right? Yes. Well, yes. Yeah, it's good. He said, we're looking, according to this right. promise, according <coughs> to Isaiah's promise, that's the only promise he could have been talking about. So that leads me to believe that, that Isaiah's promise comes into, uh, into effect after the annihilation, after the, the, the elements have melted and, and the heavens have passed away in the great noise. He's now... Peter says that is when the Isaiah 65 promise comes in to effect. Okay, so he said, Isaiah said, I, the Lord, make a new heaven and a new earth. Peter said, according to his promise, according to his promise, we look for the new heaven and the new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. If you remember what Isaiah said about that time, about that earth, he said, there'll be no weeping there, there'll be no crying there. Uh, and it goes on uh, in Isaiah 65 to say some pretty fantastic things. It makes me pretty jacked up, particularly when you see the shape that our world is in today. Yes. It really makes you, really kind of gets you excited. It's really incredible to me that we are really close to seeing things of this nature come to pass. Now, if you skip to the very end of your Bible, next to the last chapter of your Bible, uh, this is very simple theology. I understand I'm not... Uh, I'm not uh, shattering anyone's world with this information, but I want to point it out to you. Revelation chapter 21, at the very end, next last chapter of your Bible, it says, Now, mind you, Isaiah made the promise. Peter said, We're looking. We're looking for the promise. Revelation 21, he said, John writing. John said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. This is the new heaven and the new earth Isaiah promised, and Peter looked for. Now John said, I saw the new heaven and the new earth. The first earth, when, where, the first heaven and first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Remember this? Remember what we said way back here? What, what, uh, what day was it when the dry land, the waters were gathered in one place and the dry land appeared? Was that three? Let's call it three, shall we? So that there was basically a comet, science agrees with that, and you can look at any atlas and tell at one time that the Earth was all one continent, Pangea, and it was, it was separated in the days of Pele. We talked about that last week, the great earthquake that separated the Earth. And then when John said, he said, in this new Earth, what it, now this is what we look, this is what sixth day looks like. Here's the Earth, and here's all this. Here's, here's, uh, here's John right here on the Isle of Patmos, right on the Mediterranean Sea. All of a sudden, he said, I saw the new heaven, new earth, and there was no more sea. We have the, you have the same, you have the same recreation of earth as, a, as it was from here, 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 here. Okay. A lot of that is assumption, and you may not have come here to hear assumption. Okay? You may not have come here to hear my thesis, but I tell you, if you're going to believe that, you're going to hear stuff like somebody loaded it all up on a rocket ship and shot it out here. And, okay? Right. right. So, we have an explanation in a few verses that makes sense sequentially. It makes sense scientifically. It makes sense historically. It makes sense. It does not contradict a single principle of logic. Right? Okay, now you may tweak this theory and say, well, I don't necessarily agree with this or that or this or that. But what, 
as a whole, this diagram here is chicken scratch as it is. This diagram here passes the smell test intellectually, logically, and everything else. All right, so we come down to John um, in the writing of the book of Revelation. He said, I saw, I, John, he said, there was no more sea. The first earth, first heaven, the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem. We don't get into a lot of talk of prophecy. I'm not a smart guy, particularly when it comes to prophecy, but I do believe in the resurrection. I do believe in the catching away. Do you not? Amen. Uh, I believe in the catching away. Obviously, I don't. People say, well, you're your post trailer you're pre trailer you're mid trailer I don't know. Okay, I'll tell you one thing. I am pre, I am pre this. I am pre elements melting with a fervent heat. <laughs> I am pre heavens passing away with the great noise. I am pre all of these things being dissolved. Sometime before the great annihilation of it all, we will be gone. Okay? To what we call the New Jerusalem. And then, he said, the new heaven, the new earth passed away. Uh, the, the first heaven, the first earth passed away, and he saw the new earth, according to Isaiah, according to Peter. John said, I saw it. He said, and I saw this new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven. The earth abides forever. This may be heretic stuff, and you all may never want to listen to me again, but this is clearly what the Bible teaches us. Amen. This, there will be a rescue. There will be a airlift from this planet at some point before the explosion. Okay? Okay, we will be taken up to the mothership. <laughs> the earth will be recreated. Pangea will be recreated. Life will spring on the earth. And then John said, I, John, saw that holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven and brought it over for her husband. Now listen to what he says as we read that. And I invite you to go home and read what we did not read of Isaiah 65. Read that. Read the things he says that will happen at the original promise. He yes. says they will build houses and will dwell in the houses. They will plant vineyards and they will eat at the vineyards. They will not build houses and others live in the houses. They will not plant vineyards and others eat at the vineyards. You will have humanity. You will have civilization. You will even have uh, you, you will even have government because it, it says here this holy city sets itself up on this earth, and it says that the kings of the earth bring their glory into it. The gates right. shall not be shut by day or by night. Right. This all, boys and girls, this is all began in Genesis. All of this whole yes. thing. This is just, this was told on the first page, the first paragraph of your Bible. Right. It's perfect. It hadn't been tweaked. It hadn't been messed with. This was right. talked about in the first 31 verses of your Bible. All of it. All of it. Even the seventh day. I don't know. That might not get you, but it gets me. Good. Remember what Isaiah said. said there'd be no book in this, in this heaven and earth that he would create. He said the voice of weeping and crying would be no more. How did, how did John say it? He says... And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. The tabernacle of God has come to, to earth. All right? And, we'll, and um, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away, Isaiah said, the voice of crying and weeping will be no more. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain for former things are passed away. Isaiah said those former things would not come into mind. Yeah. I've had people ask me, they said, what about, what about that? Are you saying that we're not going to remember anything of this day? And I don't have any recollection. Here's, here's what I firmly believe. I know we're way away from Genesis right here, but I wanted to impress you uh, today that, that the whole story was told in the first 31 verses of your Bible. Yeah. Yeah. And incredible, right down to... The suspicious leaving out of evening and morning of the seventh day. That book that, book that you have is super natural. They've been, they've created this phony, baloney, crazy, loony, nonsensical, illogical theory and then intimidate you and pound at you to believe it, believe it, believe it, accept it, don't question it. Right. And we still can't swallow it. 
when they were told the whole thing, the first page, set upon the throne he said behold I make all things new and he said unto me right these words are true and faithful amen so from the very beginning from the very beginning God had it all figured out it was all foretold the book of Genesis friends you can't let it go amen We've proven already that you can't, we just had my dominoes tonight, we've already proven that you can't let them knock Genesis over and say, but I'll take Jesus. You can't let them knock Genesis over and say, but I'll take glory. It's all there. Right, right. You defend it. You give it a stout defense. Right, right. They're, they're, they're dealing with, we're dealing with a straw dog here. There's nothing here. This is where truth is. Yes. Amen. Thank you for being here tonight. And uh, Brother Walsh there does such an incredible job at explaining all that. I stay organized enough to, to get through all of that because that's what it looks like now. Brother Whitley, can I ask you? I keep the foundation is going to be here forever. That's what I've been thinking a lot about. So eventually God destroys the earth apart and heaven is the earth away. Is it conceivable that then the foundation is forever because the Lord takes the same substance and the same yeah, that's what and creates the new heaven and the new earth? So it doesn't pass away forever, it doesn't pass away. And the only thing that was before that was Jesus Christ. And even though we go to the grave and we see corruption, Christ never saw corruption in his DNA and everything about him will always be. And we came from it, we're in him. So even though our bodies are destroyed, If the, earth, if the earthly tabernacle of this body be destroyed, he said, we have, and b by the way, it does say that, that Adam was created in the figure of him that was to come, so yes, Jesus was the original. That's good. That's good. Anybody else, anything before we go? We're way over time. Um, we're going to get we're going to get past Genesis, although we should probably spend a year talking about Genesis. We're going to get past it, and we're going to move on, because I don't want people to get, get uh, bored with the subject. We'll be talking about new things in, in a week or two. Maybe even next week. We'll see. But uh, stand with me if you would. And let's, let's ask the Lord to. Uh, well, we, there's no reason, folks, why we should not have confidence in what we believe. Amen. We should be able to get, even already after five weeks, we should be able to give a, a stout defense. Yes. Because I assure you that what you're getting from the world is a, is a, is a bullying, not a defense of anything, but a, an intimidation. We can defend what we believe. It all makes sense. It's sequential, it's logical, and it's true. Amen. Father, we love you today. We thank you for your mercy and for your love. You are gracious and good and kind to us all. Bless everybody in this room, Lord. I pray, Lord, that your, your hand of goodness and protection be upon each one, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would thrill our hearts with your word, Lord, that you'd wake us up to the truth in it, Lord, that you would shine it down upon us, Lord. We love you and we thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. 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 We'll see you tomorrow night, I hope, at the old Bible study.